Greetings, it's the e-bike guy here again. I have some merch up at T Public. You can find my stuff under user spam me account. Apparently you cannot just simply type in spam me account in the search and find me. You have to actually put in slash user slash spam me account. Go figure. But anyway, let's uh, talk about e-bikes. Now there's several types of motors that you can put on an e-bike. Or rather, there's several types of motors you can put on a bicycle to make it an e-bike. So I thought I'd make a, a video on the various types of motors because I've been asked this question a lot of times, what's the best type of e-bike to get? The uh, short answer to that is whatever your wallet can afford. But uh, originally, um, there was a car company, I think it was Ford, maybe, I don't know, that was originally making e-bikes. Um, they were brushed motors and they were friction drives. Uh, basically, it would lower a motor onto the wheel and spin the wheel, and when you're no longer using the motor, it would raise the motor and you'd be back to being a regular bicycle. These weren't too popular. Um, they had a tendency to bounce off of the wheel whenever you were uh, putting them under strain. If you were going up a hill or something like that, the motor would try and take up the torque or the, the load and it would eventually start skipping off of the tire as it tried to uh, push you up the hill kind of thing. Now friction drives came in all sorts of various different uh, setups. These are just a few. Uh, this is one of the more professional ones where it actually had the, uh, the casing for the, uh, the friction motor up here and then it had the batteries down below. But most of them were just simple little devices like this where it would raise and lower the friction drive onto the tire. After friction drives, you have what are called uh, mid drives or bottom bracket. And basically, they attach directly to where the crankshaft is. And this is what a typical kit kind of looks like. and they can get kind of complicated and that's part of the, uh, the problem with them. Of course when you buy a bike that was built with a bottom bracket or mid-drive from the get-go it looks much better and can actually be a little bit less mechanically complex. I think that was the last bottom bracket. Yes it is. Okay so let me get rid of these uh, tabs. So we have friction drives, which worked, but they had a tendency to bounce. Then you have mid drives, bottom brackets, which work, but can be mechanically complex. And in fact, some designs actually have the motor sitting out roughly here where my mouse is going around in circles, and I have a little chain coming back and attaching to the, uh, the crankshaft. And, uh, the strength of the motor can actually bend the mounting plates that uh, mount the motor to the bike frame. So they often have to be uh, twisted back or reinforced and various things like that. But basically they're mechanically complex. Next we have what are basically, I, I, I would call them a, a chain driven bushing attachment where essentially the spokes have a, a felt bushing applied to both sides of the spoke and then a metal ring with uh, bolts and nuts attaches to the, the spokes of the rim and then you have a chain going to a motor which makes the wheel spin kind of thing. Now these are a little bit less mechanically complex than the bottom bracket slash mid drives but the big drawback here is that if these bushings are not properly aligned then your chain is constantly falling off and if you get that part right which isn't that hard to get right but when you get it right 
The other drawback is that over time, the force of the motor, the stronger motors, have a tendency to break your spokes. So if you're one of those types of people that is always turning the motor on with the throttle, going from stop to full throttle, then you're putting a lot of tension on your spokes and that's how they end up getting broken. But if you always pedal from a stop and get yourself started that way and you ease in your throttle, it's not that bad. This actually works. But as I was saying, when you start getting up to the stronger motors, it's more likely to break spokes. So most of these type of drives, um, you should probably stick to 12 and 24 volt. The higher the voltage, the faster the motor. So these are good, but they're generally not top speed kind of motors because of that. Now they often come in various different forms. So here we have a motor that's uh, closer to under the seat and you got a belt driving another sprocket back here and then you got another chain going down to another big sprocket which is again attached to the rear wheel with a bushing type of uh, setup. And when I say bushing, I'm referring to these two felt or rubber rings. So one rubber ring goes on one side of the spokes, the other rubber ring goes on the other side of the spokes, and then these metal plates are on the inside, and this uh, metal sprocket is on the outside, and then these bolts go through the entire assembly and lock it all into place. And then you get your chain attaching to your motor, and the motor attaches to the frame using these mounting plates. And then you got your wiring running from the motor to your controller, and then from the controller up to your throttle up on the handlebars. So those, while they work and they're, they're fairly cheap, they do have the problem with the broken sprock, uh, spokes. Now the next type of uh, electric e-bike conversion thing is creating what's called a pusher. So here we have one of those trail bike arms. Now on the right hand side here this attaches to your seat post stem. The bar of course comes down to the back wheel and the back wheel here is an electric motor. So you have the wire for your motor running up to your controller here and then you would put your batteries in a saddlebag over the bar kind of thing and then you have wires running up to the front bike where you have your throttle attached. And of course these come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, this one is going to attach uh, closer to where the uh, axle is on the back wheel. There we have another one. It is as you can see one that attaches directly to the axle and it's just basically another bicycle tire that's had a couple of metal bars put on it and then they've mounted up an electric motor with a chain going directly to the uh, sprocket on that wheel and then they threw in a couple of uh, batteries one on each side to power it and of course they uh, started coming out with uh, little kits like this that you can attach to a, a regular bicycle. And I think that's the last image. Nope, there we go. They also came up with some of these that aren't electric at all that are actually gas driven. So it's not a, a brand new thing. And some of them are little tiny, uh, I guess this is what they would call a, uh, a leaf blower motor where they've done something similar to a little tiny wheel. So that's what you get with your pushers. Now, of course, the problem with the pushers is that, uh, well, if they attach to your seat post, well, if you apply the throttle while you're in the middle of a turn and this bar is not directly in line with the bike, you have a, a tendency to what's called high side to happen, where it, it literally kind of pushes the bike over horizontally to the direction of travel. <laughs> So if you're ever turning and you want to apply throttle, you have to severely lean the bike against what would be the pushing force. They work. Um, 
I haven't really heard very many bad things about them, but I imagine one of the drawbacks is that if the, the assembly of the wheel back here isn't heavy enough, and if the rider component is too heavy, the back wheel here can probably skip off the ground while it's trying to push. So that's probably one of the drawbacks of this type of design. Now this is a front mounted chain driven motor. These are kind of rare. And I suppose the biggest problem with these is getting the, the motor to properly mount to the one fork arm. Because I can I imagine that unless you're drilling through the fork to get this to stay in position, it could slide up and down because some forks, as you can see right here, are thicker up above and they get thinner down below. So this is sort of like a pair of pants just falling off of a fat guy kind of thing. Uh, so you have to drill through the fork and a lot of people don't like doing that. But other than that, this will work. Uh, another problem is that the stronger the motor you have here, um, the stronger the lateral force is going to be on this mounting point. So you can, you can, if you have too strong of a motor, end up bending the fork, not up and down, but uh, sort of laterally in towards the spoke, or outwards away from the spoke, depending on the rotation of the motor. So these, while rare, do kind of work, but you, you can't put too strong of a motor on them. And of course, you have to put a sprocket uh, onto the front wheel kind of thing. So the next type of electric bike motor is your standard direct drive electric hub. And of course, this kit would normally come with your motor, your controller, and your throttle. And then you've got a brake lever that tells the motor to turn off. And some kits have this little device here, which is a pedelec. In other words, it only turns the motor on while you're pedaling, because these little magnets spin on the crankshaft, and it creates a current in this metal plate that has a wire that goes to the controller. And of course, the faster you pedal, the more current is going to be there, which means the faster the motor will go up to its set limit. Most people don't like using the pedelecs, they just use the instant throttle. Easy enough to control the motor with the amount of, of uh, turn of the throttle. And of course these are available in front motor kits or rear motor kits. Now typically when you do a front motor kit, that means you've got weight down low in front and most people like to put the batteries up high and back to sort of counter that weight. Now, of course, that means that both of these weight positions, this is the front wheel over here on the right on both of these images. So that means your motor's down low in the red zone and your batteries are up high in the red zone. So as long as you've got the two of them matching roughly in weight, it's not that bad for, for the impact it has on the handling of the bike. Of course, the best positions for weight is down low in the back in the middle in the middle and up high in front. And that's why your your typical baskets on the front handlebars are up high in the bike. Because it's in a good position for weight for handling of the bicycle. And here we have uh, another front motor kit with your battery weight up back. And this is a uh, a fat wheel bicycle which are good for driving on sand if your wheels are not high pressure, if they're low pressure. It gives you a really good uh, connection surface for, for sand driving. Problem is that these fatter tires and driving on sand both and separately completely drain your battery really, really quickly. Now one of the drawbacks of hub motors in the rear is that the distance between these two dropouts, the metal dropouts that the axle goes into, are different spaces depending on how many sprockets you have. So if you have an 18 gear, you're going to have a lot of space here. 
so the axle of some kits might not be long enough. So getting the distance, the length of that axle is pretty critical. Otherwise you, you might not uh, be able to attach it to the bike at all. With the front conversion kits it's not that bad because most front forks are pretty standardized in size. Now one of the types of uh, conversions for electric bikes you really don't see that much of but what's are very possible is just taking a regular tricycle and mounting a motor and some batteries and a controller and all that right here on the back section where your chain is driving from the motor directly to the axle of the rear of the tricycle. Now this is what we have not really seen a lot of yet where it's really a removal of any of the rear baskets on a trike and putting the motor directly onto the axle. Typically it's done by some sort of a chain, but this is possible and there are a few out there, but uh, they're pretty rare. And the extra wheels here don't really do much. It's uh, just to make it look kind of cool, I guess. Now this is the type of uh, e-bike conversion that uh, I actually find very appealing but I've only seen one seller selling them somewhere in Ontario. Basically it's one metal bar that is almost a loop so it goes from here all the way back and around and it ends and you got a gap so you can just walk right into the bike sit down and then you got this weird funky old-fashioned pedal crank with the chain going to the back wheel and what they do is they replace the front wheel with a small hub direct drive and then up here they mount the battery now you can also do a chain driven motor to a non direct drive hub wheel so you have your motor up here your battery up here your controller up here and then your throttle up here so it's all on this upper bar and then it just attaches to a big sprocket down here on a, a regular front wheel. So you can do that sort of thing as well. The uh, reason I like this is that it's placing all the extra weight in front, pushing the front wheel solidly onto the ground. Where without it, the front wheel here doesn't actually have an awful lot of weight on it because most of the weight is across the back axle. But I do like the easy accessibility for these. If you are going to get a tricycle, this is an example of what you want to look for. This rear wheel, its axle is supported on both sides of the wheel by metal. If you only have it supported on one side, then you have a tendency over time for that axle to get warped and bent. So the better, better trikes have it supported on both sides. Now this is the type of uh, tricycle electric bike that you don't really see much anymore. Uh, where right here, where my mouse is moving, you have a metal plate and your electric motor was mounted here and then you would have a chain going up to the axle. So one wheel would be driven by the motor and the other wheel would be driven by your front pedaling in your chain. So the motor would actually not affect this right hand side wheel at all. It would only affect this one wheel on the left. It had some interesting effects. Um, but most of these kits uh, were originally with uh, brushed motors and brushed motors, unless you can disengage them, um, drag on the bike when you're not using the motor. So they weren't that popular. And trikes, for instance, that really aren't that popular either, um, even though they're really good for driving in the winter. Now, one of the other things you can do is you can always build your own e-bike. And this is an example of uh, someone with uh, manufacturing skills has made a mount for a motor and a big set of sprockets to do exactly that. Now the drawback to this is that uh, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now this motor is firmly fixed to the frame so that's good. 
but the chain back here is attached to that motor. So on the left up here, this sprocket or transaxle, whatever you want to call it, the chain is going downwards. So you're, you're uh, pulling this metal downwards. And then on this chain, it's pulling in the opposite direction kind of thing. So you got from the top left to the bottom right, the left side is being pulled. But on the right side, the chain is sort of being pulled from top right to bottom left. So you sort of have a clockwise rotational motion on this entri entire transaxle assembly. So this has to be mounted really, really well. Otherwise, it's just going to get torqued and twisted and be torn out of alignment. So those are the various types of uh, e-bikes that are out there. Uh, these are some of the, uh, the t-shirt merch kind of thing that I have up on my little uh, tpublic.com slash user slash spam me account. Um, now for me, the best, simplest, easiest e-bike conversion is a simple direct drive and on the front wheel. It is the simplest to put on, the, simple, the smallest number of moving parts, easy to do. Now there are benefits to your mid-drives and your chain-driven e-bikes and that is that you have very good efficiency of the usage of the electricity. So it's very good for longer distances. But you're going to pay for that in terms of more mechanical complexity, more things that can go wrong. The more moving parts that you have, the more things get loose, the more things get out of alignment, the more things break down. The cheapest e-bike conversion kit by far is the one that uses the same system that the gas bike conversions use and that is the uh, the felt sprockets that attach to the rear wheel sp uh, spokes and then attaches to a motor that's attached to the frame. That's the cheapest. I've seen them come in at around $200 and $250 thereabouts. Then you, you buy a couple of motor, uh, a couple of batteries to power it. Um, you have a small controller and throttle and away you go. Uh, but like I said, you have a tendency to, to break your spokes. But it's pretty cheap to get a, a, a set of uh, rear rims as a replacement every now and then. Pain in the ass to try and move that uh, compression ring thing from one wheel to the other and replace it all, but it's probably the cheapest. Um, the bottom brackets, I would not want to touch one of them with a 10-foot pole, um, but I hear for those people to get them mounted and get them mounted properly, they work like a, a charm, like a dream, um, and they also have the high efficiency for battery power usage. The friction drives, pretty much nobody uses them anymore because of the bouncing issue. But they, they do exist where they are firmly attached to the rear axle so that they are not capable of bouncing off anymore. They are firmly, firmly attached to the wheel. So they are out there, they do exist, but they're kind of rare. Um, and then the drawbacks from the previous versions kind of get, have given them a bad reputation kind of thing. I imagine the newer ones that are firmly attached to the wheel, they're a little bit mechanically complex to make sure that's firmly attached. And uh, I suppose that unless they've got some sort of a release mechanism, you get, get a little bit of a drag on the wheel when you're not using the motor. But those would probably be the next cheapest electric bike motors out there. The, the mid-drives are probably the highest, most expensive ones and the simple direct drive hubs are probably the third highest in expense, second highest, I guess you would call looking at it the other direction, or, or sorry, uh, the third least, the third less expensive, second most expensive, I guess is the way to put it. Um, 
but those are the ones that I like to go with. Um, very few moving parts, solid. Your motors are literally nothing but magnets and an electromagnet. The only moving part is a couple sprockets. The thing that gets damaged most often on those on direct drive hubs is the wire that goes into the hub. And more often than not, that's because of user error rather than any fault of design of the kit. So typically what happens is somebody will change a tire from a flat or something like that and they will fail to properly secure the axle when they put it back in the dropouts and then when they apply power to the motor the motor will spin out keep spinning that wire will get wrapped around and around and around and around that axle until there's no more uh, wire available and then it, it damages the wire um, the other thing I've seen is the uh, the wire doesn't have any sort of uh, metal plate protecting it or no no coil so it's just the wire sticking out and the user will fail to properly secure the wire so it can jiggle back and forth a little bit and sometimes it'll rub against the spinning tire and slowly wear away at the, uh, the rubber coating and you eventually you get a short. Um, those are really the only uh, failures I've seen of the motor itself on a direct drive. Now of course all of these motors have a controller and the controllers are composed of electronics and one of the dirty secrets of electronics is that capacitors dry out over time and fail. So you have the same same capacitors in all your TV sets and all your computers etc they, they eventually over time will dry out and they will die. Better made ones will last longer poorly made ones can actually blow up. <laughs> um, but that's the drawback to the electronics. Now the good thing is that most controllers are like a little hundred dollar or less item um, that you can simply just pick up and swap out. Now of course the next big discussion to have about electric bikes is all about batteries. What are the best type of batteries? What are the cheapest type of batteries? What are the safest type of batteries? Uh, but that's going to be a video for another day. So that was it for the rundown on uh, what type of electric bikes or conversion kits are out there. Um, now there is one type of uh, electric bike I didn't cover and that's the type that you can buy in a store. Yes they exist. Now the problem you're going to run into with buying an electric bike pre-built in a store is that it's going to cost you about a good five hundred to a thousand dollars more than if you simply had a bike and did a conversion kit. Most e-bike conversions are going to come in uh, around one thousand dollars or less thereabouts. That's uh, starting to not be the case because of the way the uh, monetary conversion is happening especially with a Canadian dollar. Uh, the Canadian dollar has just fallen another five or ten percent. Um, so now when you're looking to uh, buy um, what would have been a four hundred dollar kit just a couple months ago is now turning it to be about a six hundred dollar kit because it's not just you're, you're not getting hit just on the price of the kit you're getting hitting, hit on the price of the shipping you're getting hit on the price of the uh, brokerage fee when you bring it across the border and then of course you get hit with Canadian taxes on top of all of that so it really jacks up the price really quickly so you're looking at one third to fifty percent more than what you were paying previously just from the the price of the Canadian dollar dropping um, so if you can find a kit that's already in the country that's been here a year or two where they priced it before the Canadian dollar fell grab it quick everything else is coming up uh, as more expensive so typically you're looking at like I said about a thousand dollars for any any conversion kit and battery set no matter which way you cut it you of course need a bicycle you need the motor kit and you need the batteries the batteries are expensive the kit you can vary your price on that and the bike itself you're probably gonna wanna make sure you've got steel front forks or at the very least steel dropouts on that bike that uh, is say aluminum. Um, aluminum dropouts do not do well with electric motors they can be bent 
like butter. So if you have an aluminum bike, use a torque arm, preferably two. My rule of thumb is that if it's an aluminum bike, you must use two torque arms. If it's a steel bike, if it is under 500 watts, you can get away with one torque arm. If it's over 500 watts in steel dropouts, use two torque arms. If it is steel forks and the kit is under 250 watts, you can probably get away without using any torque arms. And when it comes to bikes and stores nowadays, you're typically looking at around $1,600. Now, you can, of course, find an occasional electric bike in a storefront that is less than that. Uh, but you're probably going to find that you're getting a smaller geared motor instead of a direct drive motor. Uh, and it's probably not going to be as strong. Ah, that's something I didn't talk about earlier. What's the difference between a direct drive and a geared motor? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like. The motor has gears inside of it. So you're, you're trying to use a smaller motor and then using gearing to get a, a greater mechanical advantage. Typically, in my experience, the geared motors work well, but you're going to end up with slightly less torque. Uh, the other thing that you will run into is that electric motors have various ratings like S1 standard duty and S3 intermittent uh, occasional duty. Um, to put that in terms that you can understand, think of S1 as the amount of force you're going to get when you're driving on the flat and S3 duty is the short term heavy duty that you get when you're climbing a hill. So a typical direct drive 500 watt motor, you're going to be using only like one or 200 watts of that when you're on the flat. You're only going to get the 500 watts or more when you're climbing a hill, simply because you don't need the full 500 when you're on the flat. But when you're talking about a geared motor, often they'll tell you that it's a 500 watt motor. But what they mean to say is it's a 500 watt S3 motor, but it's probably an S100 watt motor on the flat. Um, now sometimes you'll get a motor that's listed as 500 watts and it's actually 500 watts S1. So on the flat it gives you the full 500 watts. Those motors will give you a lot of torque right off the bat but they're still going to give you the same top speed. But what they do with S3 on the hill is it's probably about 1500 watts. Typically, your S1 to S3 is going to be three times as much. So if you got a 100 watt S1, it'll probably be a 300 watt S3. If you got a 500 watt S1, it'll be a 1500 watt S3. It, that's not a hard and fast rule, but that's typically what I've seen. Okay, so that's it for uh, this video. So have a good day and keep on e-biking.